everybody and thank you so much for joining us all today for our, our event and adaptive look at stress with eBay and Natalie Pennicott. Um, for those that don't know me, um, my name is Luke, my pronouns are he, him and his and I'm going to be our host for the, uh, for the session. Um, a little bit about me, so for work I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Diversifying Group, we're an organisation that supports companies to become more inclusive and we do that through recruiting, consulting, training and events like this. Um, outside of work, I'm a really big advocate of championing positive mental health and reducing the stigma, particularly around mental health in, in men. Um, I'm the chair of a charity called the Matt Palmer Trust, which was set up in memory of my um, uh, departed friend, Matt Palmer. Um, I'm also a qualified mental health first aider, um, and I'm really happy to, to be, be chairing this session. Um, a little bit us and our, our relationship with eBay. So we've been a partner with eBay for quite a few years now. And I guess what we what we share in common, amongst other things, is a desire to create workplaces that are safe and where people can belong and they can be themselves and they're genuinely happy. You know, the kind of ones where fear doesn't exist and you can talk and be open about challenges and issues and things like that. So with eBay, we were really excited to put on this event today because what we wanted to do as part of Stress Awareness Month was to shine a light on such an important topic um, during this month. You know, stress is something that impacts millions of us on a daily basis and has you know, really profound effects, whether that's on our physical health, our mental health, our relationships, our well-being at work, our performance work and, and things like that. So it's really, really, really important. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping. So in this session, um, we're going to be really excited to welcome Natalie in a moment um, for a keynote, which will last around 20 minutes. We're then going to have around a 25 minute panel discussion with some colleagues at eBay. And then at the end, we'll be taking any questions that you've got for the panelists or for Natalie. So feel free to drop them into the QA box at any point during the session. You'll see there's two boxes at the bottom of your screen. One's a chat box where you can pop in who you are and where you're from. And thank you so much for that. I can see we've got people from Birmingham and other awesome places. But if you've got any questions, pop that in the Q&A box and we can um, uh, make sure we leave good space and time at the end to cover those. So lastly, um, we are recording the session. So if anyone needs to drop off or would like to revisit some of the advice or insights later, you will be able to do that. And there'll be a, an email or a comms that comes out in a few days time from, um, from Steph and the team here. So without further ado, it's a great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Natalie Pennicott. Um, Natalie is a performance wellbeing specialist who has delivered impactful sessions for colleagues at eBay and other organizations. Amongst other highlights, she's also on the Mental Health and Wellbeing Committee for Snowsport England. And I'm really, really excited to um, welcome Natalie, who's going to be sharing some of her award-winning framework on Sleep 3.0 with us today. Natalie, welcome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Luke. What a very professional uh, introduction, what we say. I guess I really want, and it's so important to me whenever we're talking about putting choicefully your sleep health front and center for your stress reduction strategy and your mental well-being strategy, that we make it really human. And so I've deliberately and very consciously oriented this session to be for the people that have bothered to turn up right now to impact their own sleep health tonight, okay? Not just talking about theory and research, just helping you, that's where it starts. Can we sleep better? And guess what? When we sleep better, we're more naturally resilient. We don't need to look to McFix it for our stress reduction strategy. Actually, we tap in and tune into our own abundant stress reduction and resilience. And here's why. In the pandemic, most of us in the Western world were only sleeping five or six hours. Naturally, when we're under stress and trauma, as we are continuing now, we're really impacting our sleep in a negative way. We weren't getting enough before the pandemic anyway. The average Westerner was sleeping for only six and a half hours. So under the recommended seven hours. And guess what? There's another aspect to this. We were spending 90% of our time indoors, away from natural, powerful daylight, away from nature. And then the pandemic made us live even smaller. It was even more difficult to access really good sleep health. So my talks, my work, I guess the orient and shape of the last decade of my work has been to transcend beyond sleep hygiene. What do I mean by sleep hygiene? Well, it's a really solid, but very basic and ununique way to look at your sleep, to say, do this, don't do that go to bed at exactly the same time and wake up exactly the same time. Do not look at screens three hours before bed. Well, guess what? We need a more nuanced conversation about that. What does that really mean? 
Does it matter the content that we're watching? Why shouldn't we look at screens? So today I want to impact you in a different way and try to elevate the conversation. So you leave this 20 minute talk, if you like, with your own impactful way to strategize sleep well-being for you. So the first slide I've got up, I really want you to consider your sleep as a really good return on investment for your mental well-being. Forget everything else. Just like me, because I work with GB athletes and elite athletes, I'm not an athlete myself. Most of us really want to show up every single day in the best way for those that we care about, not necessarily ourselves, those that we care about, those that we lead as compassionate leaders. In order to do that, we need to have really good, consistent energy. We need to have good thought processes. We need to have access to really good cognitive ability. We need to move away from attention lapses. And guess what? Sleep is the very definite best return on investment that we can possibly get. So if we consider the last 30 years, what has been the messaging around stress reduction? It's a big industry. What has been the messaging? Consider that for a moment. Stress is crushing. Stress doesn't help us. Stress inflames immunity and is not good for us. Yes, it's debilitating, but it's not the whole picture. What happens if you work on the front line as the people I support? What happens is every day is stressful. How do you sleep then? How do you sleep if you work in the NHS and you're in shift work? How does that really work? The full picture of the argument hadn't really been explored until the brilliant work of pure sleep research, if you like, from Stanford University. So we've got 30 years, 30 years of empirical research that actually shows the truth. The stress can be enhancing. And I know that creates a bit of limit friction, particularly when it comes to insomnia, as I've just experienced having neurosurgery last August. If we're not sleeping well, how do we think about stress as enhancing? Doesn't feel good. We feel relatively crappy. We don't have full access to our brain. We feel fatigued, we feel tired. We feel a little bit sketchy. And I know that to be true, but actually choosing on purpose to take a very deliberate and different stance that stress is enhancing is incredibly powerful. It doesn't mean the stressor. So it doesn't mean the fact that we're not sleeping very well, but what it does mean is that we can say, what is the choicefulness in this picture, in this scenario? What are the choices that I can make? And I want this conversation to help you very definitely pivot beyond going to bed at the same time. I want you to know the three science-backed levers that will leverage every single day for you an easy way. You're already sleeping. If you enhance your sleep, what we're really saying is you enhance your natural bound resilience your natural bound stress reduction. So this becomes front and center of your strategy. The brilliant thing is, is so unifying. We all have to sleep no matter what the circumstance, no matter where we're living, no matter where we're sharing our homes with. We all have to sleep every single night and it doesn't require the very best mattress or unusual, very cool sleep technology or sleep engineering. It just requires you, your central nervous system, and a sleep trust in your ability to just power down and wind down. So I want to talk about that. But before I do, I just want to spend two minutes, if you may, talking about mindsets for health. What do I mean by mindsets? We have multiple mindsets. We've known this in sport for decades and decades. But for me, I felt this wasn't in everybody's hands. Mindsets are incredible because they have a direct impact on our physiological, if you like, our internal mocktail effect. So it's not just the thoughts that we have, but it's the thoughts that we have that are attached to the feelings and are attached to the gut response and attached to our sleep quality that we have. So when I say mindsets, in case you're thinking, I'm not sure I really have one about sleep or sleep pals, you may or may not do, but I know you will about healthy eating. What do I mean by this? Healthy eating, consider right now what your mindset is around it. Most people have quite a different optic. We know this because the public health England messaging around healthy eating isn't working. 
So many people think when it comes to healthy eating, that's great. It helps me enhance, optimizes my day. Other people think this is really difficult. I know what to do, but I'm not sure how to implicate it. It feels like I don't have enough motivation. Other people think, oh, this is not good. Actually, I like eating in this way. It's it's really weak for me. I don't I don't like that. It costs so much money to healthy eat. None of those are true or bad. None of those are right or wrong. They're just a mindset about something. But here's why they matter. Because they orient and shape our habits and where we put our focus. And the same for our sleep health. If we don't consider our sleep and our rest and recovery to be of the highest priority, particularly as I'm talking about today for our mental well-being, then we won't prioritise time for it. We won't do the things that help us, as I'm going to talk about in a moment, the practical steps that really help us. Here's a really good example of that, and I just want to bring it back to mindset research. So we're talking 30 years across the pond at Stanford University. Here's how we change a stress is debilitating mindset into a stress is enhancing. Actually, if we're not getting the sleep that we need, can we still choose? to have a stress or sleep stress mindset that will help us move on in the day. These are the things that make a difference. For an athlete that I work with, this is everything. But for us, the general person, we need to choose to adopt this kind of mindset to say, well, I can't change the sleep stress I've had. Perhaps I'm only sleeping five or six hours, but guess what? Those five or six hours are really enhancing. We're still upgrading our brain, our body and our central nervous system. Let's not choose to look at the one or two hours sleep that we've tried to strive for for perfection. Most people I work with, 30 or 40 people a week, very much start the conversation with this negative self-talk. I'm only, I'm embarrassed to say, I'm terrible at sleeping. I'm only sleeping five or six hours. I'm waking up during the night. So they're priming themselves to say the end goal is eight hours. It's all or nothing. Well, guess what? Those five or six hours count. If I was working with you right now in a performance way, if you were choosing to row the Atlantic, you would only be having two hours sleep on, two hours sleep off. But guess why that works for 40 days? Because your body knows there's consistency, there's precision, there's a strategy. There's a rest strategy. There's a great mindset around it that it's a short-term implement for a long-term goal. We can do that. We can have this kind of stress resilience when it comes to our sleep health. But day in, day out, I see people get themselves into a quandary because they're layering on a duvet, if you like, about this stressful way to think about sleep. I'm not getting enough. I'm not very much a good sleeper. I feel really tired during the day and I don't know what to do about it. So I'm going to help you at the end of this talk orient into the three most impactful ways, science backed, that you can leverage your sleep health tonight. And in fact, tomorrow morning, it starts during the day. But just to illustrate that for you in the best way, what is your mindset around your health? What is your mindset around healthy eating? I mentioned that a few moments ago. Two brilliant studies happened at the Mind and Body Lab in Stanford. They took some hotel workers who were doing exactly the same output. The process was the same. But for six weeks, they gave one half of the cohort that your work is great. Your work is healthy. Your work is resilience proof. Your work is future proofing your health. And then they took the other cohort and they said, yes, your work is really hard. It's stressful. You can only do exercise later on at night. Yes, I know your work is really tough, but you're doing it for purpose and meaning. So it's very much a downgrading or an upgrading. Guess what happened? Not only to their thoughts and their well-being and their stress thinking, Things happen to their internal physiology, their biology. When we looked at their blood sugar, the levels, those that had had six weeks of stress is enhancing. Actually, your workers exercise everything, their blood pressure, 
everything went in the right healthy direction that we would expect it to go to. So expectation is everything. What is your expectation when you wake up in the morning? Do you judge your sleep at night in a helpful way? Or could you choose to be more practical? So let's move, thank you, Steph. If we can move to slide four, that would be brilliant. So let's have a look at this. The three most impactful ways are often so overlooked when it comes to sleep well-being in the media. And this is why I've spent the last decade and beautifully working with forward-thinking organizations such as eBay and many others to say, we need to first and foremost expect and protect our sleep health. When it comes to a mental health stress reduction strategy, sleep health is free, zero cost, and it starts the moment that we wake up. Impact of light. Why does that matter? We have an internal body clock and it starts building the moment that we wake up at the same time every day. If we can, five days out of seven, or even six days out of seven, wake up at the same time every day, that is massively impactful and a huge, powerful lever to our sleep health. It really matters more than you think. It's like settling down this internal beautiful mocktail that we have, otherwise ignoring a fizzing can of Red Bull and just breaking it open on a Saturday morning. So if you want to recalibrate your mental health and your natural resilience, choosing this consistency is everything. Number two is acknowledging sleep pressure. Sleep pressure, most people I work with feel pretty sketchy, even in high performance or in workplace. Anytime we want to show up and do our best, and I suggest that's every single working day. Every day we're working with our colleagues for a great organization, why not deserve to wake up with great focus and a great sense of well-being? Did you know that waking up on the same time on a Saturday and a Sunday will help you do this? Most people think about Sunday night as a Sunday night scaries because we think about the fear-based element to our sleep health. Well, actually, it's more akin to social jet lag because perhaps for you, you've woken up at the same time every day for five days and then you've completely switched it and corrupted it at the weekend. And so you said, I want you to have joy. I want you to have fun. But did you know that actually if you get up at the same time on Saturday and Sunday, you will mitigate that feeling of Sunday night anxiety. You couldn't have a nap like an athlete. You can have a nap at 2, 3, 4 a.m. in the afternoon or 2, 3, 4 a.m. later on, p.m. It's really important that you understand that if I get up at the same time and I feel tired, I need to think like a corporate athlete. And I can have and I can enjoy this little later on 20 minute nap. The other element you need to think about is movement. We can be really active with our sleep health. Nobody talks about this enough outside of a performance athlete world. If you move in the morning, if you move, whatever is your antidote, if you like, to stress, fast walking, getting outside, dancing, moving, natural daylight, all of these things are really, really, really impactful. They're useful, practical tips, and guess what? They're zero cost. They're incredibly helpful. And the third step, if you like, is your mindset around sleep. Choosing that consistency, if you like. Choosing to get up at the same time every single day is incredibly impactful. So if I want you to take one thing away, sleep is Bitcoin. Sleep future proofs your stress reduction, but it moves way beyond that into the camp of stress prevention. Actually, how do I see myself every time I choose to work in a psychological, psychological safety workplace? Do I have a part to play in that? Can I choose to make sure I'm well slept? Can I choose the right kind of mindset that means that I make the choices that I need? I can think more clearly, I can have more clarity, even if I'm guessing, and we've done a huge body of work with teenagers, by the way, and this is helpful. I'm so far beyond a teenager. I'm in my midlife, but this body of research was impactful. For the average 17 year old, going to bed 30 minutes before equated to a 21 
minute increase in their sleep quality. Guess what that does for your talent, for your thinking, for those memory cognitive lapses later on. It smooths the whole day out. If you're suffering from anxiety, or if you're feeling like right now in your world, after the pandemic, things are feeling full on. You're feeling the very start of burnout. Burnout doesn't happen overnight. We have to self-tune into that. Guess what? Sleep health and sleep well-being, paying attention the moment that you wake up. Can I rest more? How do I feel? Can I get outside? Two hours of natural daylight improves your sleep quality by 21%. And then we're talking about just before bed as well. Dimming the lights and having darkness also improves our sleep quality. Being active during the day improves our sleep quality. All of these things are really practical, zero cost, and really count up to the very best stress reduction strategy you can possibly take. And also sleep return on investment for future health future mental health, and also mental health right now. I've just seen a message as well. Thank you so much. Steph, I'm going to ask you to jump in and uh, moderate some of the questions that are usefully coming up, because I think it's really important. People don't understand the effect of powerful natural daylight on our sleep quality, but also our concentration and our focus during the daytime. So we get this double win. If we get outside for two hours before midday, we get increased cognitive function, we get increased focus and less cognitive lapses, but also we win later on at night, we get improved sleep quality. That for me is effortless. That is the reason why we should look at innovating our commute, if you like, simple zero cost ways to improve our well-being. Thank you so much, Natalie. And 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 wow, gosh, the, so, so much. It's hard to remember sometimes. I'm I'm chairing here, and all the things I'm like, okay, must remember to do this, must remember to do that, and and some really powerful tips and advice. Thank you, thank you so much for that. And I can see there's some really amazing questions already starting to come through. So if anyone's got any questions for Natalie specifically, please do pop them in the Q and A. We'll definitely make sure there's some space and time um, to answer. Thank you, I think Angela already. There's a really, really awesome question you've asked already. So so thank you. So just um. Would love now to move on to hear a bit more from some colleagues from eBay to get their thoughts and perspectives on this on this topic as well. Um, so I'll be soon to have a bit of a chat with Josh, Niti, and Z. Um, and I think there's a few questions that we'd like to to ask them. So um, Steph, if you don't mind, maybe Josh to begin with spotlighting, and I'd love to ask Josh a first question. So Josh, hey, how you doing? You okay? Good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, not bad at all. Thank you. Not bad at all. So um, I'm going to put this question to all of the, the panelists from eBay, just so we can kind of hear a bit more about you and your your um, your your perspective. So I'd love to love to hear, Josh, if you don't mind saying a brief intro about you and if you maybe could share some insights on how you've learned to navigate stress throughout your career. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Josh Williams. I've been at eBay for 10 years now. It's mad to think about that. And um Throughout those 10 years, I've definitely learned lots of ways about how you navigate stress. And I think if I were to list them out now, you'd be here for a long time. So <laughs> I'll give you my top three. And I think before I share them, I think it's important to remember that this won't work for everyone. People are very different. And secondly, it's really easy to say and much harder to do. So as much as these are my top three, um, it's I try my best to stick to them. So the first one is I try and make a to-do list and make sure I prioritize work and home. Maybe I target the top three, and it's really important that you communicate that, that with your boss, your team, or even your partner in life. And the second thing is I try to understand what triggers me in a stressful situation and not react in the moment. Um, and I actually read a really good book, and if you want someone to read it, it's called The Chimp Paradox, where you digest it, take some time, and they give a really good example of you're queuing for a train and someone pushes to the front of the train and they get on the train. And in that moment, you want to react, but actually that person might be rushing because their uh, loved one is in hospital or something like that. But it's just very important to take a step back and think in that situation. And I try my best to do that where I can. And the last one is um, just time away from the screen. 
and through the pandemic, I think that became even more important. So I try and carve some time out in my diary. I put, I've got an hour in my diary for lunch and I try my best to get outside and exercise or walk, whatever that might be. But they're the three things that I try to do when I navigate and manage stress. Thank you so much for sharing those, Josh. Yeah, a lot, a lot of those resonate, particularly the screen time bit. I think it feels almost weird to be away from the screen at the moment and we need to reverse that. <laughs> we need to reverse that, don't we? Um, Thank you. Um, I'd love now to welcome uh, Niti onto screen as well. Um, Niti, hello, how are you? Hello, I'm very well. How are you? What a lovely discussion so far. <laughs> Great. Um, so I'd love to ask you the same question, Niti, maybe say a brief bit about you and would love to hear about your relationship with navigating stress in your career. Of course. So um, very nice to be here. My name is Niti Awasti and I have been with, uh, with eBay for a little over eight years. So you have a lot of eBay veterans here. Um, um, and my role in eBay is I head up business operations for the UK business, a role which I took on very recently, about four months ago. So, you know, much as it was exciting, it came with a lot of stress as well. So, you know, I, 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 can, I can certainly speak from my own experiences in terms of how I manage stress. Um, I think for me personally, um, and you know, very much to Josh's point, we we all have our own ways to manage stress. So it may, it, it may work for you or not. But but sharing my experience, I think the first thing for me um, was to acknowledge that I had stress, right? Because uh, I you know for for a long time I sort of you know live my life thinking stress is what happens to everyone else, and you know my life is good. I should be grateful for what, what, what I have, but not acknowledging that we all have stresses of some kind. So, you know, I think that's very important to acknowledge that um, stress happens in all, 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 all of our lives. And to Natalie's point, some stress is good, actually. So, you know, it can also help us, uh, you, you know, uh, become more, you know, better at what we do. And then I have um, something called what I call a rule of seven plus one. It's a very simple rule, um, but this is something which I adopted during the pandemic and I'm, I'm trying very hard to sort of, sort of keep, keep to it. Um, Natalie would be ha you know, happy to know seven is all about seven hours of sleep and you know, how do I somehow get myself seven hours of sleep? I don't achieve that every day and, and you know, I'm going to try very hard to not feel bad about it, but you know, how, how do I have that seven hours of sleep? Very important for me. And then the one hour is how do I find one hour for myself in the day and it doesn't always have to be exercising it, some days it's it's just one hour of watching netflix or you know talking to a friend but but really really being very very deliberate about finding that one hour for myself so 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 that's what i do and the third thing i'd say is we talk, we often talk about boundaries right we we, we 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 talk about boundaries but i think the way i look at boundaries is yes we need boundaries in our life but boundaries have to be flexible what that means for me is there are times that I have to stop work earlier because I have to go and support my son's school show. Equally, there are times when I work longer and my son has to eat takeaway food because work needs attention. And it's really about, about being okay with boundaries and, and the people in your life being okay with boundaries and you deciding when and how those boundaries work. So I would say those are my, my three ways of managing stress. Thank you so much for sharing those needs and yeah that boundaries but I think for anyone who's a parent or caregiver will understand that trying to be regimented isn't that easy is it and the reality no, of life no. kicks in and you can't beat yourself up when things go awry because they because they will go awry so thank you for sharing that um so I'd love now to welcome our last panelist um to the screen last but definitely not least um Z welcome Z how are you doing Hi, I'm good, thank you. Nice, nice to be here today. I've already learned, I've already learned a ton in 32 minutes. So um, yeah, ni <laughs> nice, nice, to, nice to be here. Um, should I, should I go, Luke, with well, my, with my three? Happy to ask you <laughs> the third time, but if you know what I'm going to ask, I'd love for you to go. Well, I, I feel like we've got such good, like great insight from Josh and Niti. Hey, so I'm um, Z Khan. I'm, um, I work in the people team um, at eBay, and I'm, I'm, I'm based in, 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 in Europe. Um, I have been with eBay also for ten years, so Nita was right. We've got we've got um, we've got some eBay veterans here. Um, I don't know if I manage stress actually, and so I feel like I'm always on a roller coaster of um, a roller coaster of stress. And sometimes I'm good at managing it, and sometimes I'm really terrible at managing it. And the interventions that I try and use. Um, really only work when I notice that I'm in a moment of stress. And so that's the most important thing is just kind of for me to take to take a moment to just notice and, and like check in with myself. Um, 
I spend a lot of time, like everyone, I guess, on Zoom at the moment and talking. I feel like I'm talking for eight hours every day. And so for me, moments of silence are really important. And, and like sometimes I call that meditation. Sometimes I call it drinking tea. Sometimes I call it taking a walk. But any moment where people are not talking to me and I'm not talking um, it is always helpful for me in reducing stress. Um and then, and then just and and then being in connection and community with things and people that I love is important as well. So sometimes that's my dog, although I don't love him every day when he's like if he's misbehaving. <laughs> sometimes it's my husband, um, and then sometimes it's friends and family. And so those are some of the things that I I like deploy when I notice. But but often I'm you know often I don't notice, and there's just like an underlying stress going on. So um, so yeah, so that's 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 me. Thank you, Zian. Thanks for sharing that. I loved your articulation of moments of silence. I think if someone had asked me during the pandemic, I was like, I just want to like stare at a wall for 20 yeah. minutes and not speak, not see, not think or something yeah. like that. I think your way of describing it's much nicer than my stirring up walls. I might, I might borrow that. Thank you. Um, so next question I'd love to kind of like put out to, to anyone who feels like they'd like to, to, to share something. And, and I guess this is a, I suppose, an aspect of the work that we do and something that we think about a lot. And that would be to think about um, how important it is to consider inequality and privilege when we talk about mental health and stress. I'm, I'm happy to kick off if that would be, if that would be if that would be helpful. Um, look, like for me, I think it's just so important for us to remember, for everyone to remember, as we're going about our lives in the world, that when we talk about mental health and wellness, we're all coming from a very different place. Like our experiences of life, growing up, um, early childhood experiences, all of that plays such a role in you know, I think how we deal with different challenges and how equipped and resilient we are to deal with different challenges. And like, um, for me, inherent in that is all of the privilege and inequality that um, that just exists in society. You know, like, I, I guess I can speak personally in saying that growing up in the, in the Pakistani community, you know, talking about mental health at that time was just not something that was considered appropriate or, or proper. I think that's definitely changed now. And so even just acknowledging that people's language and ability to articulate how they're feeling is different, given the context that they've gr grown up in and the context that they kind of live in, you know, whether that's, um, it can be even dependent on where you live in the country. So it's like geographically specific, um, your, your gender, your race and ethnicity, um, you know, your socioeconomic background, all of that, I think, plays a role in how comfortable you are in speaking about mental health challenges, in accessing and being able to access support. Um, and then if I put like a, an employer lens on it a little bit, if that's helpful, like I, I do think like as an employer, employers, we have a responsibility um, to make sure that we are creating space for healing conversations to happen in a way like the pandemic I think Natalie you spoke about this the pandemic has kind of been a bit of a leveler so privilege and inequality exist definitely but we're in a collective mental health crisis right now um, and a state of trauma in some ways and 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 we know that sharing story and being in community can help heal trauma and, and so like as employers, like how do we create that space in a safe way for people to share and have leaders role model sharing vulnerably their own mental health challenges um, and then like back it up with substance. So provide that, um, provide that uh, access to counseling and therapy and, and pay for it in the right way. Like all of that stuff I think is, is, re is really important and none of it will, in will solve Priv the privilege and inequality that exists but it like hopefully will move will help us move towards that you know as a, as a society um like those are some of the things that come up for me as we talk about that yeah thank you see and, and, and that probably leads quite well actually to the question i'd love to put out to everyone on the on the panel and then it'd be great to get natalie back to get to get natalie's thoughts um so i guess then you know we're touching on the pandemic quite a lot and the the changes in approach that maybe as employers and leaders that we can take um i'd love to hear around kind of any any of the things that have changed i suppose specifically in the workplace that you're in and for ebay over the last few months and years um 
yeah, thank you, Luke. If I, if I may just add one minute, if you can hear me um, really well. Wow, Z, what an incredible conversation and um, illustration that you gave of the whole landscape of changingness. One word that stood out for me is uniqueness. It's this human element when it comes to mental health, sleep well-being, resilience, stress awareness, stress reduction. It's really unique for all of us. But there's one thing that we can do. We can take psychological safety for ourselves. And in order to see that, we need space and time to be understood, but also to get away from technology. It can be incredibly helpful, don't get me wrong. The future of mental well-being, the future of sleep health lies in technology's hands, but it also lies in our own technology, our own central nervous system. And just taking 10 minutes out to defrag. If you consider yourself as a human athlete, Look, we all want to show up every single work day for our colleagues, for ourselves in the best possible way. I'm not talking about performance, I'm talking about connection, being there, being authentic, being heard, listening, just connecting in the real world that we're living. This is so incredibly important. And I thought, see, you just mentioned that beautifully, this uniqueness, but also this whole brain, whole body body thinking that we have this opportunity to move it forward to say what do I do every single day what are the habits that help serve my thoughts my feelings my connectedness around this and sleep health is the great unifier no matter your religion no matter where you are your past experience every single night all of us have to move away from technology to transition to journey down into sleep if we understand what sleep is if we understand we need to ignite the relaxation response, we can do this better for us, not better for anyone else, better for us. We get to show up with better cognition, better access to our natural born resilience and better focus and habit change. These are the things that move the dial more than anything. So what I love about this whole, if you like this movement around sleep health front and center for our mental well-being strategy for ourselves, first and foremost, self-leadership, compassionate leadership, but also for future thinking organizations, is that we need to put this first. It doesn't cost anything, it's zero cost. Every single night, we may sleep for five, six, seven, eight hours. Stop comparing, look to the science-based tools. Let's get on board with the things that we can do. We can take an active role in making change. That is really important and that's essential when it comes to bouncing forward. I don't want to bounce back from the pandemic. I don't want to bounce back from Putin. I want to bounce forward with strength. I think most people will nod their heads on this. Sleep health is a really good place to start. No matter if you're struggling with insomnia, no matter where you are on the continuum, same with your mental health, meet yourself in the moment and think, what are the things that I can do? free things that I can do and hopefully this workshop has given you some ideas. Thank you Natalie, yeah, some great great insights and um, thank you. Um, maybe maybe I'll put this to Niti I guess then kind of based on um, um, the work that's been done and the change has been made, is there anything, any, anything practical that you might be able to share that, that eBay's done since, since the pandemic? Yeah I mean lots of things right, I mean um, and 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 can I start by saying that you know the way that the approach eBay has taken is because because our 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 home and work life has become so fluid now uh, you know especially during the times when we were all working from our homes uh, it's not about employee well being or it's not about workplace well being it's it, it's about your whole well being right and and it is about thinking about. Um, you know what works for you might be very different to what what works with Z or what works with Josh. So I, I I think some of the things and Josh would obviously talk about some of the initiatives they've taken, but but I think there has been a real focus on 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 sort of acknowledging that when we especially as we come out of the pandemic and we come back to work, um, that we are not trying to go back to to the old ways of working because that doesn't exist anymore, right? So you know how do we how do we embrace this new 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 world because it does come up with with lot of lot of opportunities and 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 benefits as well. So 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 it's really moving forward than trying to sort of replicate what we were you know the ways we were working before, and I think the second thing is to sort of acknowledge that. It, there is no one hat fits all solution. So, you know, everybody will have their own circumstances and, and how do we sort of create a workplace 
um, which, uh, which which sort of accommodates all of that and supports that, but very much underpinned by this need to come back together, very much underpinned by the community spirit that 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 is so intrinsic to everything at eBay, right? So, you know, we've had since the time we've come back to work, we have had lots of sessions where we come back together. We have had some fantastic listening lounges where you know they have been in intimate settings where we've been able to talk to our colleagues and really open up and understand their stories and 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 you know sort of show up in an authentic self and say you know this is how 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 the pandemic has impacted me and i always think ultimately one of the most powerful things to ever do is just ask how you are and sort of start that question with that and ask again and and you know spend that time to because zoom made us very transactional so you know as we come back together spend that time to you know uh, to, to get into each other's lives a bit more, understand what our circumstances are. And, and, you know, because, and all of that actually is very important for, you know, better working relationships and, and so sort of our, you, you, you know, how we work together. So, yeah. And I'm sure Josh can share some, some examples of what he's been le 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 leading as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I definitely echo that for sure. I think one of the things that we did during the pandemic and has continued is though, so for me and others, um, exercise is really important. It builds self-esteem. It, it helps with anxiety. It helps give you that thinking space. So at eBay, we made a conscious effort to create an exercise and mental health group where not only do we discuss exercise, but we're very open about mental health. I think that's just trying to combat. I think that's something I've seen even with my friends and at eBay is how the conversation about mental health has become more regular, but it's still not regular enough. So this is the channel. This is, we're just doing it through instant messenger. I mean, now we're back into the office. We're encouraging each other to go for a walk, go for a run and have those conversations about work and mental health. It's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that, um, Josh. And um, if anyone's got any further Q and A's they'd like to put to Natalie or the panel, um, there will be time in a moment. So please do, do pop it in the Q and A box. I see we've got some amazing, amazing questions there already. Um, so the last question I'd like to ask them before we open up to um, to the attendees Q and A would be to explore maybe a little more. And there's been some amazing suggestions already, but explore a little more around any advice that we might have to be a compassionate leader, a compassionate leader post pandemic, and a compassionate leader, I guess, in the world that we're we're living in now um you know what advice or tips you might be able to share to anyone who's thinking okay cool you know how can i be better to my colleagues how can i be best better to better to the people that maybe report to me or a part of my team hi Luke. thank you what a great question to um i guess conclude is how to be human at work isn't it neaty well everybody in the panel has just really summed it up all the unique elements that enable us to show up for other people. We need to show up for ourselves first. We need to have the energy and also to open our mindset. But I thought Niti expressed it beautifully with just some very simple questions. How are you? But the key, the key pivot, if you like, was she said, how are you again? How are you really? And I loved that. Just being able to spend three minutes is really difficult in this world. People are struggling with how to find focus for three minutes and to really not put what your own thoughts and feelings are, just, just pause them, not to eradicate them, but just to pause them for a second and really connect with other people. We can only do that if we sleep well or if we understand what it means to sleep better for ourselves. You know, Josh mentioned about the movement innovation that's happening. It's not just moving to change body shape we've moved far beyond that it's movement to feel good yes to show up for our physicality and have gratitude for our physical bodies but also to enhance our mental health to drive resilience we can only do that if we're well slept we can only do that if we have a really good sleep health strategy so all of these things come together showing up connectedness for other people movement but also the sleep responsibility that we have at night it's, it's great potential for Moving away from thinking, I need to fix my stress. Stress is all around us. If we choose on purpose, this stress is enhancing mindset, then we can handle anything. Then recovery becomes essential. 10 minutes your way. As you know, I think everybody on the panel has described how a few minutes getting outside or moving, connecting with others 
it's so beautifully unique. You, not many people actually take the time to say, what is my best way to do that? How can I represent meaning in that? Just one thing. It becomes really simply a time trade-off. If I'm going to prioritize sleep, resilience and mental health, and stress reduction, all of those things come together. How will I do that? What's the one thing I'll do less of in order to do more of that? This is when it becomes effortless from a habit change point of view to go, instead of waiting for that next uh, content show, I won't mention any names, to roll on by, can I choose to go to bed at the same time every day? Because I want to put myself first. I want to put others first. There's no right or wrong way. There's just, this is how I am. This is how I want to show up in the world. And it just makes sleep health really easy. It makes mental health really easy. It makes resilience and compassion really easy. Compassion really in the moment of stress with kindness. I think we can choose to meet our moments of stress with kindness ourselves. Let's take it away from theory and really make it effortless and simple for everyone. What's the one thing you're going to do? I'd love for everybody who's tuning in with self-awareness and curiosity right now to, to just make that one choice. If I'm going to do this, what will I do less of? That time trade-off is a really practical way to close this session. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, be kind to ourselves so we can be kind to others. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I'd love now to go to the Q&A and thank you so much for, for the questions that have come in. Um, I'll open these up to the panel, but it may be, Natalie, that you feel well placed to answer some of these questions, particularly, I guess, as a, as a professional. Um, so please feel free to take if, um, if they're right. So the first question from Angela, thank you very much for this, is, is asking around, how do you help someone see stress as enhancing if they are dealing with long-term unemployment and don't have enough to enough, can't afford housing, have children to care for and so on? Yeah, of course. Well, the first thing is to understand that the research has been not the stressor, but the approach that you can take for it. So during suffering and trauma, and this is where all the research has come from, it's not to deny the landscape of unfairness, unjustness, nothing is fair about the stressful situations and scenarios and life situations we find ourselves in. But our mindset can be, what can I do? Will I take care of myself? If I can't fix things that are out of my control, will I still choose to show up for myself and do the basics? Can I still sleep? That's zero cost. Can I still choose to have more positive or neutral self-talk? These things take the duvet, that extra sting out of the scenario. We know this from therapy, from trauma response, from frontline mental health. In my mind, these things are effortless if we understand why they work. And I've been there. I say that with, you know, I've experienced a full continuum of mental illness and mental health. I have self-harm scars on my arm. I've experienced deep trauma and deep resilience and deep thriving post-traumatic growth. So I say this also from not just therapy speak, from a place of personal experience. And we see that time and time again when we look at research around times of trauma, the pandemic, obviously the ongoing war that's unfolding right before our eyes. What are the things that we can do? Sleep is a really good way. See sleep as overnight therapy and a sense of resilience to withstand trauma. You deserve to do that. I can't change the circumstance, neither can you, but I want to point and shape and orient to the things that may be helpful for you, the helpful strategies that don't include buying anything, a thousand pound mattress, a beautiful pillow, a beautiful sleeping environment. So I hope that helps reframe some of what we said today. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie and Angela. Thank you for the question. Um, I want to put this next one to, to, to somebody from eBay. Um, there's a question here from Abiba um, around any tips that you may have to support colleagues that appear stressed? I'm happy to start. So I, so I, um, I really liked what you said, Natalie, about the cu the curiosity piece and like the listening to understand. And I think like that's probably the first place that my head goes to is um, in those kind of interactions that you're having with with your trusted teammates, with your manager, with the people around you. When you start to listen to understand, what you'll notice is when people are in a in a in a heightened state or feeling more stressed than they usually would. Um, 
but actually that's really hard to do right when you when you when you might be you might be feeling it as well and and so I, I do think like um yeah like those consistent interactions trying to notice that you're listening to understand and not listening to respond not feeling like you have to solve it either um and yeah and and again like trying to pr- provide and create safe spaces as leaders for people to be able to to ask the right questions and and ask for support and help as well those are some of the things that i think about niti i saw you unmuted there yeah and i was also going to say no, absolutely agree to everything you've said and also o- also sort of acknowledge the fact that sometimes people don't want to share and even that's okay right and 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 you know um sort of giving them the time and space to you, you know, uh, come and open up to you when they want to, but, you know, to be supportive all the time. And I think the, the way, uh, one practical tip that I've often used is because I think uh, mental health um, and, 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 you know, talking is, is, is still something, you know, all of us are sort of getting used to by different levels. So, you know, I've certainly made, made a more concerted attempt to be open about my life and my stresses. And, you know, I often find that when I do that, that then triggers you know, a colleague to speak about theirs. So, so, you know, I think there is, there is very much about being open because if you look perfect, then it's highly unlikely that somebody's going to come and talk to you about their stresses and strains. So, so I would say that as well. I think I'd have to, I'd have to echo that as well with what Niti was saying. I think it's really important for you to be open sometimes as well. And having worked with Niti over the pandemic, it definitely helped that I could be very open about what's going on in my life. And it's okay to have a bad day. Like it's okay. If you want to be honest about it, you can. And I think I really relate to what Niti was saying around being open yourself as well. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that vulnerability at work, isn't it? I think that's a thing that we haven't been doing in the past and it feels like it's a normal thing and we're starting to see the real benefits for everybody of doing it. This fear we had of, oh, is it weakness? It's it's not, is it? It's the opposite. Um, Thank you. Um, I'd love to put the next couple of questions to, to, to Natalie, if I may. So Natalie, there's a, there's a question here, which is to do with um, any thoughts you may have on working out in the evening and how that can affect or benefit your quality of sleep. Yeah, of course. Well, lovely to kind of dive in with a practical question, because, gosh, this has been a source of much debate across the last 10, 15 years, particularly when it comes to performance sport, because you know, all all the kind of research was, this is a great thing to do. We're kind of powering up with strength. We don't get stronger when we work out. Let's remember that we get stronger when we sleep overnight and rest and recover. That's such an important pivot point. We always think when it's, we're in doing mode that we get stronger. No, actually when it's, we're in recovery mode that we really truly get stronger from a physiological point of view. Um, Two things to consider. Wakefulness. So when we work out, if we choose to work out, most people choose to work out. We tend to enjoy it. Perhaps it's got deep meaning for us. Perhaps it's about changing body shape, losing weight, having fun, just being healthy, whatever. It's a right or wrong way. But most people start with a mindset in mind. That feels very energizing. Even if you're just doing yoga, it feels really energizing. And of course it changes our breathing. And it does tend to implicate a sense of activeness, even if it feels kind of low level relaxation. So that's something to bear in mind when we're trying to power down, when most of us are struggling to ignite the relaxation response, any kind of movement, and I don't just talk about exercise, does naturally feel, if we choose to do it quite awakening, energizing, kind of that refreshing mindset, it takes a while it moves our core body temperature to transition down into the sleep window we need to have this what we call in our sleep world a flip-flop switch of a drop in core body temperature so it doesn't really help us it can enhance lots of other health pathways but when it comes to if we're struggling with sleep and switching off quite fast most people want to be able to go I need to sleep now and I need to drop off. So that's one thing to consider. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm helping you shape your choices when it comes to, ah, can I just, what happens if I do that during the day or the morning? That's the other thing. Thank you, Zina, as well. It's super helpful to know. Not many people know because we see movement as this helpful paradigm, but it does raise our core body temperature. It raises our game in so many ways. It raises our brain state and it raises our breathing. The other thing to consider as well 
is that it's so far removed from winding down. So think about moving that time back. Um, for athletes, they have to train at night. Most of the time that we get to see the mindset work is at night. Let's be honest, on the Olympic pathway, their time is itinerized out from seven in the morning till eight, nine o'clock at night. So, you know, they don't always work out in the morning. I think it's the same for us. But I think the thing that we're doing more than moving out with our body is we're only attending to our stress and cost of living crisis and all the things that political crisis that mean deep meaning for us is we only think about them on the pillow so if you don't have a time during your evening to consider and talk and debate about these things if you sit on them and passively watch content and tv consider how you're moving your mind right when you hit the pillow that's such a powerful pivot for people to say wow I'm really not doing that enough. And I'm only thinking about these things when I lie down at night. No wonder I have a racing mind, that kind of handbrake on sleep. So consider doing that in the morning. Consider perhaps waking up at the same time every day and thinking about those things that really matter to you. So I'm not against movement. I'm not against a racing mind. A racing mind usually means that these things that we're thinking about are really important to us. They have deep meaning and deep mindset. Think about the timing of them. Can I consider these things earlier on in the day and create that natural wind down? Um, that brings the conversation on from boring old sleep hygiene, which is don't look at your screen, don't think, only relax for three hours before I go to bed. Most teenagers say, what on earth do I do? How do I survive? <laughs> um, I think that's true for most of us. So deep, dark, dim lighting is really powerful. Think about your environment. And think about just being with and attending to or using your movement to get that stress reduction out, to think about the things that really matter, get that frustration in the world out um, during your workout and just move it maybe a few hours before you go to sleep. I understand it, you know, it definitely creates wakefulness and it does ignite your core temperature and it does ignite your brain and your thinking. All of those things are a natural handbrake on trying to go to sleep within half an hour. So make those choices that you can, do those things, but think about the timing. That's what sleep health really means. Thank you so much for sharing that, Natalie. And, and wow, a, a lot there I'd never thought about when it comes to exercise and the impact afterwards. Um, sadly, time's not our friend for this. So I guess there's a few questions that we I think we're not going to get time to answer, I'm afraid. But while um, we'll, we'll, we'll have a chat with Steph and see if there's a way in which we can answer those questions when we do the follow up, because they're really important and powerful questions that have been asked. Um, before we wrap up, though, I wanted to just ask one last question to anyone from eBay. And it was a question that came in last, but I think it's a really important one, which was around particularly now many of us are managing remote teams and people that are working from home what thoughts or tips can anyone give on how you can kind of keep that morale or I think the word used was camaraderie um, up so that people can function and feel connected at work anyone like to answer I think you have to find time. I think you have to be deliberate about it. Um, I think there is no other way. So, you, you know, I certainly, um, you know, at eBay, we have we, we have we have recently introduced something called eBay Unlocked, which every Thursday it's an hour for us. It's in a culture calendar where we got to get together, which in fact is in half an hour's time. And I'm very much looking forward to it. So, you know, I think it, it is about thinking that very much as part of your work, uh, part of what you do. Um, so, so you, you know, and, and, and making it top priority, uh, you know, and always finding that time would, would be my, my comment there. One build would be um, not to imagine that it's easy either. I still think that we have to, there's loads that we're going to have to relearn around how we think about inclusion, making sure that, you know, people in different environments are given the right projects for exposure, reward, recognition, all of that stuff. I, I definitely don't think we've got, we've answered all of those questions and that a lot of it will come through the, the test and learn process that we're in right now as we go back to work. So that would be the only thing that I would add, but completely agree with you otherwise, Nancy. 
And thank you so much for sharing. So I wanted to just take this moment and say a massive thank you to everybody that's attended today and really hope it was valuable for you. A massive, massive thank you to Natalie for sharing such powerful thoughts, perceptives, insights. I've personally learned a huge amount in the short space of time that we've had. And if anyone would like to learn more about Natalie and Natalie's work, um, there is a link that's been popped in the chat. So please go, do go take a look and there's Natalie's LinkedIn profile as well if you'd like to see that. Um, thank you also to the panel from eBay for so generously giving up your time and sharing your insights as well. Um, hugely appreciated. And if anyone's interested in um, eBay or working at eBay, we've popped a link in the comments as well for any open roles and, and, and vacancies. So a huge thank you from us. Um, thank you so much for, for, for the insights and the takeaways. And here's hoping that everyone gets some, some better sleep. Take care, everyone.